Okay. So you know, right? Ashwin gave us, uh, I think, we lecture with a lot of the uh, uh, theory insights, and then we'll, we'll go back the slides without equations. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's a lecture two, and uh, I will continue the discussion of uh, these uh, two-dimensional magnets and then show you what we can do with it. So, like I say, mainly we're going to focus on these uh, the the halo structures. But uh, initially, I'm going to show you how we can control these uh, two-dimensional magnetisms, right? And uh, use uh, electric fields. Then I'm going to talk about the example I'm pretty excited about is uh, uh, the spin lattice coupling effect in the systems. Then the last part I'm going to show you is uh, the how to use these proximity effects to control the, the spins, pseudo-spins, and also hopefully the last part I'm going to talk to you about how to control these uh, uh, Carroll edge states in a topological insulator. Okay, so here's just a, a quick recap, right? In the morning, we talk about the chromium triiodide. It's a layered antiferromagnetic insulator. And uh, what it means is, for individual monolayer, it's ferromagnetic, and the interlayer coupling is antiferromagnetic. So this gives rise to these uh, you know, spin flip transitions, right, as we sweep the magnetic field. <coughs> and uh, I mentioned this example with tunneling junctions, we can measure the tunneling current as a function of the magnetic field for these four particular devices with four layers, right? And we have these uh, intermediate plateau showed up. And uh, for the top panel, it's a uh, correlation signals as a function of magnetic field. So basically, the correlation is for this particular state, the magnetization M is equal to 2 and the corresponding to this intermediate state. And for this magnetization M equal to 2, there's four possible configurations, okay? Right, with one layer pointing down and with the other three layer magnetization pointing up. So the key is this minority layer right, can be at the top or can be anywhere in the middle or can be in the bottom. So the total magnetization is the same for these two states. They sort of, uh, in terms of magnetization, they're degenerate. However, if we look at the, if, if we consider the system favors interlayer anti ferromagnetic coupling, right? So we can see the top two states, there's only one interface which is anti ferromagnetic, and the bottom two states actually has two interfaces, is anti ferromagnetic. So if the system favors anti ferromagnetic coupling, then the bottom two states we should have lower energy than the top two states, right? That's just a, a, a logic thinking. Then we can focus on these two states at the bottom, which has lower energy, but also energy degenerate. So for these two states, we call them bistable states. And uh, in, in a magnetic field, uh, a challenging task is how to realize a, a control or switching between different uh, bistable states. The challenge is mainly coming from its difficulty of applying electric fields in a, in a, uh, in a conventional <laughs> magnetic system. Because in a conventional magnetic system, they, they usually have these it's a metallic magnet, okay? When, it's a meta when, when the system is a metallic, it's very difficult to have the electric fields go through the system, right? Because uh, metal is going to screen the electric fields. That's the kind of technical challenge here. So what we have here is that's different because it's, a, it's an insulator, right? It's a totally thin insulator. So you can apply a really large electric field, actually, to switch the magnetization. So that's what I'm going to show you. <coughs> So even though these two states are degenerate in terms of magnetizations, but if I apply a current or electric fields in these directions, now you can see this degeneracy actually breaks because the direction now is determined by the electric fields of current, right? Now you're looking through these directions. These two states are not the same anymore, all right? So if we, we can, now what we can do is how, how this is another example with this four layer tunneling junction. Now I apply the magnetic field and uh, measure the tunneling current. Now you can see initially, right, in the, if you remember, there's a plateau which one states. But for certain devices, actually I can have a plateau for the, with two different levels, right, in, for these intermediate states. So these two different levels are already corresponding to these two different states here. The, the, these two different states is the one I just mentioned to you, okay? 
Then this just a sort of a, a, a hint. You know, we do have these two different bistable states, and, uh, and <coughs> there's a chance we can we can uh, we can have them both both of them accessible by by the measurement. Uh, to to realize the control, so what we do is we make these uh, dual gated four layer chromium triiodide junctions. Uh, it's actually not the simplest device to make, right? So in the middle we have these four layer chromium triiodide, and we have a monolayer graphene on top and bottom as tunneling contacts. So here monolayer graphene is very important because not only it can access contact, but the monolayer the denser state is low, right? So the electric fields can still penetrate through. Therefore, we can control the magnetic states, use uh, electric fields or dopings. So at top and the bottom, we, we have a two gate, right? The top, we, we use a graphite gate. The bottom, actually, we use a um, silicon, silicon dioxide gate. The reason for, for the top is graphite because we also do optical measurements. So we want the top gate is transparent. OK, so this device, right, we, we apply the electric fields you know, through the samples. Then we measure the tunneling current. And uh, here I'm just going to show you three examples. The, uh, the bottom right, what I have here, here, what I have here is uh, the map of the gate voltage, right? This uh, vertical axis is the top gate, and the horizontal axis is the bottom gate voltage. And this red dot just means the top gate is 2.4 volt, and the bottom gate is 0 volt, OK? And in this condition, then I measure the tunneling current as function magnetic field, then you can see there's only one plateau, right? So one state. And this, this state is corresponding to what I draw here, right? OK, the minority layer is in the third layer. Then I can change my gate configuration into this particular dot here, OK? Then now you can see there's two states showed up, right? So what it means is we break the degeneracy between these two states now. and uh, one plateau is corresponding to these particular states, and the bottom plateau corresponding to these states. And I can continue to sweep my gate into this corner. Now, what we have is one plateau again corresponding to the, these states. So, by com combining these two gates, we actually can access different magnetic states. So, we can switch right, the, the, which states we, we like to, to, to get. And uh, here, just uh, you know, uh, another example of these two states, right? One is at the high current plateau, the other is at the low current plateau. It depends on the voltage uh, applied to it. Uh, another way to do it is we can just fix the magnetic field and continuously sweep the gate voltage, right? Previously, what I showed you is we, fi we fix the gate voltage and we sweep the magnetic field. You can see there's two states. Then what I can do is I can just fix my magnetic field at the at the particular number. Then I'm going to sweep my gate voltage. Okay, so it starts with this particular state, and then I sweep the gate voltage. You can see the current, you know, increase, decrease. But this is corresponds to switching from one state into the other state, and I can sweep the the, the gate voltage back, for example, right? And uh, this corresponds to switch the states back from this state to the other state. And that's large hysteresis curve here, right? This hysteresis curve corresponding to the magneto-electric coupling effect. So this is just one example. We we, we switch the, the magnetic states between two bistable states. And uh, we can also switch the magnetic states from one state to the other very distinct states. So the example I'm showing you here is for bilayer chromium triiodide. So for bilayer chromium triiodide, right, remember I showed you, is uh, the interlayer coupling is antiferromagnetic. So there's two antiferromagnetic ground states, right? So these two states is still, you know, they are kind of a bistable state. But the, if we can, if we apply a magnetic field, and this field is large enough, gonna drive the, 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 the bilayer from these antiferromagnetic states into this fully spin polar state. So we have this spin flip transition here, okay? You know, what we have is now we, we make this uh, and do a gated device again, right, with violet in the middle and the user graphing as a contact. Then top and the bottom we have two gates. In this particular example, then we measure, what I show you here is a curl rotation intensity plot as function of gate voltage and also magnetic field, right? The vertical axis, gate voltage, the horizontal just magnetic field. So what you see here is 
Once we sweep the gate volume, you can see, right, there's a slope here, okay? So the, the, the blue color and the red color corresponding to a large correlation signal. And in the middle, right, this uh, blank just means the correlation signal is small because it's in the anti Fermat state. And then, then each point here represents a spin flip transition. But what you can see is that the spin flip transition, actually, the magnetic field, right, for this spin flip transition can be controlled by applying this uh, gate voltage. So, for example, if I just take uh, uh, a fixed magnetic field at a particular point, a particular magnetic field, right? For example, I, I, I select three magnetic fields, then I measure the correlation signal as function of the gate voltage. Okay, so clearly we can the correlation signal was small, corresponding to a anti ferromagnetic state. Then, at large gate voltage, become the correlation signal is large, becomes a ferromagnetic state. Okay. So this is an example we can use the gated voltage to drive the magnetic states, right, to switch it from an anti magnetic state to a ferromagnetic state. But for, for, the, that, for, for the measurements I show you here is we still need the uh, magnetic field to, to help this process. So the other group, you know, the, uh, King Van Mack and Jay Chang, they also did the similar measurements, but in that device they're able to apply even larger uh, gated voltage to the samples. So, <coughs> From that data, you sort of can extract the interlight coupling J, right? Basically, you can see the J actually keep decreasing. So the positive J here represents anti ferromagnetic coupling, okay? So you can see at the very large gate voltage, uh, the J seems to indicate the J actually becomes negative. So the other say is uh, the anti ferromagnetic in interlight coupling becomes ferromagnetic, okay? But this uh, uh, is a, it's a, it's an indication here, okay? And uh, if the device can be even better, if we can play even larger field, I think this switching will happen. Okay. The other uh, pretty neat example here is uh, we know for anti ferromagnetic states, right, the, the correlation signal should vanish because uh, the net magnetization is zero. So, however, what we can do is we can apply a net electric field perpendicular to the samples. So, as long as there's net electric field, then we match the correlation signal, as you can see. Actually, the correlation signal is an increase as we tuning this gate voltage. Okay, so there's a linear response to the correlation into um, to, to this uh, gate voltage. So this sort of uh, electric field induced magneto optic curve effect. What's interesting here is we can prepare which states, which anti ferromagnetic states we have. For example, in this case, I prepare the states into the top layer magnetization pointing up, the bottom layer magnetization pointing down. Now you can see the slope is negative, okay? Then I can also prepare my states with top layer pointing down and the bottom layer pointing up. Now you can see is the correlation as long as you get the volume, now the slope actually is positive. So exactly opposite to the other states, right? So even though these two states have some magnetizations and we cannot tell which is which, but the, for these measurements actually, by looking at the slope, we can, by looking at the sign of the slope, we can actually distinguish these two states. So the slope, you know, the amplitude of these two slopes are actually exactly the same with each other, but the, but the sign are opposite because there's two different time reversal of each other, basically. Okay, so we're going to go back to this electric field control in, in just uh, you know, a few minutes later. But I want to talk, spend a little bit more time talking about these uh, spin lattice coupling, these kind of new effects we we. we what is the uh, mechanism? Uh, you know, you can use the electric to control the magnetic. Yeah. So the the key key words here is uh, once you have electric field, you break the inversion symmetry, and the plus the time reversal symmetry breaking, then then you will have this uh, electric field induced uh, correlation effect. Yeah. So the the details actually, let me see if I said it here. The detail actually explained in, in D uh, uh, two thousand I think sixteen PRO paper. Yeah. So first of all, let me just uh, cover the basics of Raman scarings. Okay, uh, in you know in a solid state system or in a molecules, right? There are always vibrations, and uh, if the infrared light is in resonance with, so for example, matches uh, this uh, phonon frequency, and if the phonon is uh, polarized, okay, means it's a dipole, right? Then light can directly absorbed by these uh, uh, lattice vibrations. So this is called infrared absorptions. Then, if the light 
incident on the material system and the scattered at the same frequency. You know, the blue is incoming light and the red is a uh, scattered light. If the incoming and the scattered light has the same frequency, then we call this is really scattering. Okay, now the third example is now we have incoming light. And then the light is going to transfer energy into this material system, basically going to scatter it by a phonon. Okay, so we emit a phonon into the system, then the scattered light will shift it in terms of frequency. So the frequency difference between incoming and the scattered light it matches a phonon energy. Okay. In this case, we call Stokes Raman scattering. Basically, a photon interacts with the, the lattice oscillation and gives the energy into the material heated up. By, by emitting phonons. Then there's the opposite process of this is called anti-stokes. Anti-stokes is the incoming light actually absorb, you know, or borrow a phonon from the lattice. Then the, the, the energy increased. So in this case, right, the energy difference of the scatter light to these incoming light matches the phonon energies. Okay. And this process can be used, for example, for, for solid state cooling effects, you know, because right, you, you take a phonon, you take you sort of reduce the vibrations, you cool down the systems. So again, right, we have these, uh, mainly, you know, we have the infrared absorptions, we have the Stokes, Raman scattering, and anti-Stokes. And for each process, they have a, for, depends on the, there's a particular Raman optical selection rules, and it depends on the, the symmetry of the crystals, and also depends on particular oscillations we're talking about. So now let's go back to this uh, monolayer chromium triad. Right, monolayer chromium triad has these uh, D3D crystal symmetries, and uh, for this 3 d crystal symmetry, I here I just write I, I decompose the 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 irreducible representations right into these uh, basically I decompose the, these uh, representation into these uh, irreducible rep representations, and this represents you know what the phonon you can have in the systems, and by looking at uh, these uh, uh, wrap. Because the crystal itself has inversion symmetries, right? Then only those modes, only those modes has inversion symmetry can be Raman active, okay? Because the crystal itself is, uh, has inversion symmetries. Then we look at the the six classes of these uh, uh, rep, right? There's a six class, you know, from A to A, one E, and there's A U, A two U. So there's six class of them. You can see only two A1G and a four EG there. Inversion symmetric, right? All the other modes, you know, two G or A1U, A2U, and EU, they're inversion asymmetric. So we only have a six modes. They are Raman active. And uh, here, just a very simple analysis. And the the all all these uh, sixteen, uh, all these fourteen actually phonon modes already calculated by, by this paper, and they basically give you a very nice cartoon, shows what is lattice oscillation corresponding to each mode. <coughs> what do we care about, the, you know, what do we have for this Raman active one is these is this, uh, uh, six of them. And then they also calculate what is the, the phonon energies, right, corresponding to each oscillations. <coughs> okay, so we'll go back to this. And, uh, our experiment is we are looking at uh, these uh, Raman spectra and trying to understand these uh, spin phonon coupling and look for what is new in these uh, two dimensional magnets. So, first, we look at uh, the Raman scatterings at a temperature of 60 Kelvin without applying magnetic field. And uh, for this, uh, the, the measurement is uh, there's two geometry for it. It's, one is called XX, means the incoming light. The excitation laser and also the, scat the scattering light, they are polarized in the same directions, okay, they're linear polarized. Then there's another one which is called XY, means that the excitation and detection is orthogonal polarized. So for the XX, it measures the fully symmetric mode. Basically, measure, if you think about Raman tensor, right, it is a, a, it's a matrix, okay? Then this XX is measure the diagonal term in this in the Raman tensor, and this XY is measure the off diagonal term in the Raman tensor. Now let's focus on these two A1G mode, which is a, uh, is fully symmetric mode, as uh, you know, indicates. Right, A means it's fully symmetric. One and G is also the same. So, so for, for 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 this particular mode, and you can look at it. Right, basically it dominates by these uh, X axis channels. 
and X Y channel is strongly suppressed. This is consistent, right? Because A one G is means it's a fully symmetric mode. What it means is the Raman tensor is should be in a diagonal term, which is the X X channel. Okay. Now let's cool down the sample, right? Here, here just uh, another way to present it. You know, in a sixty Kelvin when we measure the mode, less normalizations. So let's go down the cool down the sample to fifteen Kelvin. We do the curl rotation measurements. You see his races means that's a many orders. Then let's look at the, this uh, Raman again, right? In these X and XY channels. Now you clearly see, well, there's a very strong signal in the XY channel. Basically, there's off diagonal component coming into play. The other thing about it is so this. 128 wave non peak, right? It's no longer has this A1G symmetry because A1G is fully symmetric. Only you can only have a diagonal component. Okay. So somehow, once we introduce this manual order, this off diagonal turn coming into play. It, this is kind of easy, and you think about it, it's not too difficult to understand because uh, when you have a manual order, what it means is you're gonna if you think about the conductivity measurements, right? If you have a magnetism or time reversal symmetry breaking, you should have an off diagonal term. Then you can see these hall conductivities, right? Just hall component, you know, in a, in a transport measurement. So this is a similar concept in this Raman tensor. When you have a magnetic order coming into play, you will have introduced a similar type of hall component in the off diagonal terms. So that's why you can see these uh, off diagonal contribution in this X Y channel in the Raman scattering. Uh, but the What's interesting is, remember, right? When we measure these many order, we always say we do curl rotation measurements. You know, you shine linear price light, and you look at the rotation angle of this linear precision, but the same frequency. Now we're gonna the the, the feature I'm gonna show you is actually we can also look at the similar curl rotation effect, but in the inelastic scale right, light. Basically, the light is coming out from different frequency, right? They 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 interact with the lattice, you know, either emitting phonon or absorb phonon. So let's look at the, these. Uh, uh, Data. First, look at the 60 Kelvin. So, at, excitation is horizontal polarized. Then, we measure the linear polarization. We basically do this linear polarization and resolve the measurements for the inelastic light scattering. You can see, you know, the the the, in, the, the Raman scattering is in the same polarization as this excitation polarization. So, this is consistent with A1G mode. But what, what's surprising is now I do the same measurements at the 15 Kelvin. Well, there's a many order. Okay, now you can clearly see the linear polarization actually rotates away, right, from these excitations. And this is with my order pointing up. Then we can also flip the magnetization pointing down. Now you can see this rotation angle is going exactly opposite direction. Okay. And this rotation, we can basically map out this rotation angle as a function of temperature. It clearly correlates with this manual order. What I want to emphasize is this rotation angle is quite large, it's 40 degree. Okay. This is actually a remarkable number because the curl rotations usually only order of milli radius. At least three order many are smaller than this, even for very large curl rotations. So this kind of magneto optical curl effect actually in this system is, uh, is, is remarkably large. And uh, I won't go into detail of the theory, but uh, because we don't even have a microscope theory, what I'm going to give to you is a very intuitive understanding, right? As I mentioned to you, you know, if you look at the uh, Raman tensors, right, the diagonal term is give you these, uh, 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 basically give you this x x channel signal, but in the off diagonal term, it's like a hot conductivities. So in this case, right, because of magnetization, we can put just a Manually putting a term which is proportional to these uh, time reversal symmetry term. For example, we say edge. You can think of it as magnetic field or magnetizations. So once we have these uh, Raman tensors, then we can look at the, the light scarings, right? All we need is we're putting in the incoming light represented by 100, zero, zero, means it's X polarized. And uh, in, the, in the scatter light, it's cosine theta, sine theta zero means a uh, you know, theta just means the rotation angles, right? If theta equal to zero, just means it's x polarized. If theta is 90 degree, means it's y polarized, okay? <clears throat> Therefore, we can look at the, the scattered light 
scale length just a modular square of these uh, you know two initial polarization, final polarization, and with a product of these uh, uh, Raman tensors. Right. So let's look at the, these AG symmetry first. As I mentioned to you, for AG symmetry, the the Raman tensor only have these uh, diagonal term. So from here we can get you know the polarization just look like fully A1G symmetries, right? In the same direction as the excitations. Now we can look at the, the anti-symmetric mode, which is in the BG symmetries, okay? And only the F diagonal, off diagonal term is here. Then we do the same, very simple calculations. You get these numbers here, right? D times sine theta, the modular square. Then we, because here we only consider the off diagonal term, so the, 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 it's, it's exactly based on 90 degree rotates compared to these excitation polarizations. Now, in these measurements, right, we have both diagonal term, also off diagonal term. So this is a, a basically it's a it's a combination effect from both channels. So therefore, depends on the the ratio between these off diagonal term to these uh, diagonal term, we can have the rotation angles, right? As I show you in our measurements, you know, it really depends on what the number we choose for these uh, matrix element. Okay. So if AG dominates, then the rotation angle will be small. If it's BG dominant, it means the off diagonal term dominates. We have rotation even long, a little bit larger, a little bit larger than that, right? Okay. So this is uh, the 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 effect we talked about for the monolayers. Now let's go to bilayer. And uh, in the bilayer, first of all, I, what I show you here is uh, the XX channels, the 15 kelvins. Okay. Without applying magnetic field, then we see a peak at the 128.8, so this is the AG mode I was talking about. But now if I look at the XY channel, there's a new feature appeared, right, at the different frequencies in the off-diagonal channels. That's interesting. Now, if I apply my line field to fully polarize the spin states, okay, now you will see this new mode actually disappear, right? Now they can only show up in these AG channels. Okay, see. So in the F AFM state, we have a new mode, and in the FM state, this new mode vanishes. Oh, the other <laughs> thing about it, this mode actually shifted and uh, overlap with this AG mode in the XX channel. So we can do a little more careful measurements. The top is the co-rotation measurement, tell us what is minus states we have. And the bottom is the 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 Raman scaring in the XY channel as function minus field. It's also intensive plot. So clearly, right, these two you know, there's a very sharp switch when the spin flip transition happens. Okay. So this is kind of remarkable actually. We can control in magnetic order then to control or switch a Raman scaring mode. <coughs> Right, and uh, this only affects these X Y channel, but doesn't affect the X X channel. Right. We can also uh, confirm this off diagonal, this Raman scaring right in the X Y channel is correlated to the minor order. Mm -hmm. So here, I plot this uh, uh, signal in the X Y channel as function temperature. You can clearly see, right, it vanishes above the critical temperature. Right. And. Uh, for this uh, magnetic field, you know, either minus one t or or the one t, this x y channel also correlates to the many others, right? But uh, for the uh, diagonal term, which is x x channel, they have they don't depend on these many others. So this x y channel is a very sensitive probe of this many other. It's coming from basically the the, ferro, the whatever magnetic order we form in the system. And so that, let me just show you how we can understand this, right? These two I can use for a paper to understand what is a David Dobbs splitting. So the, the feature first I show you there's two two peaks. They got, they come from these so-called David Dobbs splittings. The idea is quite simple, right? Imagine you have two harmonic oscillators, all right? Two harmonic oscillators, they are energy degenerate. When you put together, then you should have two modes, right? But they are energy degenerate, so you so you don't see splittings. Then what you're gonna do is you start to put in coupling between these two harmonic oscillators. So this coupling here is interlayer coupling in my Van der Waals crystals, right? 
So once you have this interlayer coupling, you couple these two uh, harmonic, uh, harmonic oscillators together, then you, these two modes are going to split, right? You should have uh, two modes. One is a, you know, one basically the mode one plus mode two. The other should be mode one minus mode two, right? And, uh, the, and the energy difference between these two is uh, proportional to the coupling strength, which is uh, the, the modulus in, in, in the system. Then, then for these two modes, one is A plus B, one is A minus B. So you can see one of them is, uh, should be inversion symmetric. The other is inversion anti-symmetric, right? Basically, the inversion symmetry breaks. So well, here what I draw is there's two layers, and there's two A1G modes, and uh, they couple together through these uh, interlayer couplings. Then we got these two modes. One is inversion asymmetry, as I show here, right? They, they go out the face, right? So they're inversion asymmetry. And this inversion asymmetry becomes Raman active because in our system, right, the crystal structure is inversion symmetric. So if, if the Raman mode is inversion asymmetry, what it means is it should be infrared active. That's what just Raman optical selection rules. Then there's another mode, which is uh, the top and bottom, these two modes, right, they move together in phase. Then this inversion symmetry actually, you know, it's inversion asymmetric, then, then, then this mode will be Raman active. So the short, the, 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 the short summary is you have two oscillators, harmonic oscillators, put them together, and you can generate two modes. One is Raman active, the other is infrared Infrared active, in this case, will be Raman silent. Okay? So in, other, in the other words, we should not see two modes. We should still just see one mode, right? So why we still, why, why we can't see these, uh, uh, you know, infrared active but the Raman silent mode? Well, we have to break some symmetry, right, to see this. So we already talked about this in the morning for the second harmonic generations. The crystal symmetry itself is central symmetric, but once we add this uh, spin into the systems, for well, this layered anti fragmental order, right, once we add this layered anti fragmental in the system, you see the inversion symmetry actually breaks. So once this inversion symmetry breaks, then these uh, Raman and Southern, by the infrared active mode, now will become Raman active, because I already break the inversion symmetry. Then we can apply a magnetic field to restore all the inversion symmetry. Then this Raman active mode will be silent again because the inversion symmetry comes back. So the other way to say this, by controlling this manual order, actually we control the Raman optical selection rule, right? By, by controlling the symmetry of the crystal. All right? So this is exactly what we see. Just go back. We talked about this, right? For these, uh, uh, for these anti fragment order, Inversion symmetry breaks, so you can see this mode at the 126 wave number. This is the in initially infrared active, but now becomes Raman active. So once we apply magnetic field to align the spins in both layers, the inversion symmetry restores in the system. Then this mode now will become Raman 7 again. Well, okay, will be suppressed. Then it vanishes. But the, the XY channel we see here, just similar to what we see in a monolayer case, right? Because they're always off diagonal term there, because the, because the, the, the ferromagnetism in the system. So now we have this unique opportunity here, is uh, we can control the magnetic order, then we control the symmetry in the system, then control the Raman optic selection rules. So the opportunity we have now is, well, I don't have to you know, switching the magnet. I don't have to apply magnetic field because I just showed you we can use electric field to switch the magnetic states from this anti ferromagnet to ferromagnet, right? Therefore, you can imagine by use electric field of switching these two states, it's equivalent to I, I use electric field to control the symmetry of my, my system, right? You know, in the AFM, inversion symmetry breaking, and in these fully spin polarized FM states, inversion symmetry restores. So by just switching my gate voltage, back and forth, right? I basically tune the symmetry of the system. Then I should be able to tune my Raman modes, use, use, uh, use the electric field. So that's the idea. And again, right, for these measurements, we, focus, uh, we still need the help of the magnetic field, but we, we fix it uh, uh, by particular values near the transitions. Then we measure the Raman scarings first at the uh, gate of voltage equal to zero volt. So we see these Right? It's infrared active, but now becomes Raman active. 
then apply the gate voltage to a number. For example, basically you can see now we change this critical field value. So what's happening is now under this particular field, the system already in a ferromagnetic state. Right? Now you can see this particular peak, it's already switched off. Right? It's vanished. So basically we can use the gate voltage to switch this Roman mode. So here's just another way to look at it is uh, the top is the current rotation signal as function of gate voltage for this, the same sample. The, the same time we also match the Raman scaring. So you can see once we switch the states from you know, anti ferromagnet to ferromagnet, like this, you will see this mode initially was strong and becomes weak, and the other lineage, the other peak initially was weak and becomes strong. But these two modes basically switch between each other. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, switch gear and uh, talk about the uh, hero structures. So, so hero structure, you know, these, especially these proximity effects is quite important in terms of uh, to engineer all kinds of uh, exotic phenomena, right? For example, if you put the ferromagnet with a of insulator put together, there's a chance you can create a you know, quantum non hot insulator, for example, right? And that's what the people did. Not, they, they didn't use proximity, but the, what they did is uh, they basically doped this top line insulator. So that's how you see quantum norms, for example. Or you can use magnetization interface with uh, the superconductors and with some topology, for example. You, can, you may create a Mara fermions, for example. And so, but in the two-dimensional, what's really nice is because of the structure, right? Then the atomic interface is really smooth, then proximity effect can be maximized. Okay? Especially in the 2D materials, right? The, the, the crystal itself actually it's an interface, right? So whatever proximity effect will have a maximum effect. And this has been, you know, this similar idea has been explored in use uh, a conventional magnets with uh, and graphene, for example. In this particular example is uh, European sapphire, I think, with graphene. They see pretty large exchange field at the interface. And uh, there's also another example is with top light insulator with uh, a, a magnet, and uh, they, they show they can control this in an order. The, the temperature for the in order to form. And uh, a diff another example is uh, you, you interface a 2D semiconductor with a magnet, and you can realize uh, a spin injections. Then you can realize it's a spin polarized, okay, or, or polarized uh, light emitting doubts. The last one I want to show you is uh, you know calculation, right? Calculation always uh, you know, the prediction always very exciting. So what I show you is. Its proximity induced this exchange field can be as large as 100 Teslas. That's a huge number, right? All right. So in my lab, you know, we, we started about uh, three years ago. We we started to integrate the two-dimensional semiconductors with this uh, uh, chromium triiode. Okay. And uh, the idea is we know this uh, WIC two really well. It has it has this kind of spin value physics? And then we, we began to learn what the you know, CR3 is about a few years ago. Then we thought is maybe we would like to see these proximity effects. So let me just uh, give you a very quick overview of what this uh, transition metal dichotinides, in case you don't know about it. So for transition metal dichotinides, if you look from the top, for the model layer, they have these uh, hexagonal layer structure, just like graphings. But the difference from graphene is uh, uh, at these corners, right? One is uh, carbon, the other is uh, uh, transition metal. So the inversion symmetry actually breaks in the system. And then as uh, this paper points out, when there's inversion symmetry breaking, and uh, what's important is for these uh, direct cones that call the Brillouin zones, they actually couple to the orthogonal polarization of the light. For example, you know, for the minus k, they can be excited by sigma minus polarized light, and for plus k, they couple to sigma plus polarized light. So th these transition metal dichotinides actually is a, it's a, it's a system we can use polarization of light to adjust individual values. And uh, simply, right, this, this is a simpler picture. I want you to um, just uh, memorize for a second this. We have two values, plus k and minus k. They couple to distinct circular polarizations. All right, and uh, the data are going to be color coded. So for plus k, always uh, you know coded with uh, red light, and for minus k, coded with blue polarizations. And uh, 
In addition to these value selection rules, there are also spin value locking effects. So as I draw here, remember, just memorize these, for plus k value, always coupled to the spin pointing up. For the minus k value, always coupled to the spin pointing down. Right? So sigma plus light coupled to plus k value with spin up, and the sigma minus light coupled to minus k value with spin down. Now these two valley configuration, they are actually degenerate because the total, the system itself, right, doesn't have a magnetism, so the time reversal symmetry breaks. These two, sorry, the time reversal symmetry remains. These two valley are protected by the time reversal symmetry. They have the same energies. You cannot tell the light emission. You cannot tell the difference between these two valleys just by looking at the polarization of the light. However, if you apply magnetic field, you can break time reversal symmetries, then you can distinguish these two valleys. For example, here, you know, we apply 5.7 Teslas. Now you can see the light emission from plus k value will be split from the light emission from the minus k value. This is a little split. Energy split is a value Zeeman effect. Then I can map out these Zeeman splitting as function magnetic field, and the slope will give us the g factors of the system, right? Right. The, the next is, well, what we can do is proximity effect, right? So the simplest, uh, uh, very naive picture to think about is, uh, you know, imagine you have two electron spins, right? As I show here, there's two configurations. You know, on, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, right, the, uh, on the left-hand side, these two spins, they, they point in two same directions. And on the other one, the spin point in opposite directions. So then the, we know that from quantum mechanics, right? It, the exchange interactions gonna break the energy degeneracy between these two configurations, right? It's very simple. Now, imagine I put them in model layer, on top of these ferromagnets, right? These ferromagnets, let's assume the magnetization is pointing up. So I represent them with these very large spins, they are pointing up. Now I can shine my circular parts light to the sample. Remember? Sigma plus coupled to spin up, right? And the sigma minus coupled to spin down. So now you look at these two configurations, you will see on, on this left hand side, right, on, on this side, okay? The spin, to the spin, you know, fully excited spin is in the same direction as magnetization, but on the other one, is fully excited spin is orthogonal to, to it's anti-parallel basically to the magnetization. Then, due to these exchange interactions, these two systems actually will be energy different, right? So this energy difference, we can resolve it by the light emission from this monolayer semiconductor. If the, the signature I'm looking for is I look for the circular polar light emission. We look at the difference between these left configuration to the right configurations. Okay. All right. So here's just uh, the cartoon of the sample. We have a model at WSE2 on top of chromium triiodide, and the whole sample is sandwiched by boron nitride, just protected from you know degradations. And first, we look at the light emission from these two valleys, plus k minus k, color coded again, right, with the red color and the blue color. At the temperature is 65 Kelvin above the Curie temperature. There's no difference, right, between left and right. However, if I just cool down the sample to fat calvins, right, below the curie temperature, the magnetization is going to form. Then clearly, you can see the degeneracy between these two valleys are broken, right? You know, in the measurements, we don't apply any magnetic field. So this uh, degeneracy breaking between these two valleys has to come from these magne magnetic exchange effects. And, and I can characterize what's the strength <coughs> of this exchange field. Because I know the G factors, right, for the systems. So I also know the splittings between these two values is about 3.5 mEV. So I know the splitting, I know the G factor. Then I can infer the exchange field is only out of a 13 Tesla. Okay. Now let's take another look at these. Uh, it's, it's, Measurements at the different magnetic field. Now it's about uh, close to minus three Tesla, all right. And uh, for these measurements, we can define a quantity, which is the intense difference between these two emissions, right? Two different polarizations, and uh, we can define the difference. Dif and uh, we can define this difference of these two polarizations and normalize by the sum, give us a degree of polarizations of my emissions. Then I can plot this degree of polarization as function magnetic field. Now you see it. that's multiple switch, right? 
So this multiple switch has to come from the magnetization flip of this uh, CI3. The other way to, to look at is uh, at each flip, there's a, large his, there's a clear hysteresis curve here, OK? You know, each of them. And uh, it's really clean data, right? So what it means is my interface <coughs> actually is really good. The other important thing is uh, I want to emphasize again is what I'm measuring here is actually light emission coming from the model in WSC2. And we all know model in WSC2 doesn't have magnetism. But once it has this proximity effect, you can see light emission polarization, everything, right? Has these kind of hysteresis effects. So the means is you can think of this model in WSC2, and now it's a ferromagnetic semiconductor due to the proximity effect. Okay? So the other thing we can look at is energy splitting between these two peaks, right? Just the Z-mass splittings. So we can measure the Z-mass splittings as function of magnetic field. Again, now you can see these uh, multiple switching behaviors. Okay? And last thing we can look at the, is uh, the line width of these peaks. Right? So we can also plot the line width difference or just line width of cell from these peaks. But here, let's just look at the difference. Now you can look at the difference of the line width also has these behaviors. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about it. What does this difference mean here? Okay. So let's just put all these together, right? We have these values floating, we have this language difference, then we have these polarizations. They all show these uh, uh, strong dependence on the magnetic field. It has these hysteresis behavior, it has these multiple switching behaviors. And so, what the physics behind this, right? As a very simple picture is this coming from a spin dependent charge transfers. So, what that means is the chromium triad and the WSC2, they form these called type 2 band structures. In this, well, what matters here is it means the conduction band, the lowest energy conduction band is in chromium triad, you know, in this uh, EG band. So then the conduction band in WSC2 has high energy. But the, the conduction band at WSC2 is labeled by two values, right? One is a plus K, red, the other is a minus K, blue. And each of them, right, they are associated with spin. One is pointing up, the other is pointing down. Now, assume our magnetization first starts with uh, pointing up, and the empty band is EG, which is also spin polarized. Now, I'm going to pump my system with sigma plus polarized light. So I'm going to excite sigma plus polarized spin in the conduction band of WSE2. Because there's energy difference, right? The, you know, these two bands, there's energy difference. Then the electron spin in WSE2 Will transfer to right. Will transfer to the EG band of these uh, CR3. So population transfer. So when this population transfer happens, the net electron population in the WSC2 will be reduced. Therefore, the PL will be reduced, right? Because luminescence is coming from the electron hole recombinations. If the total population electron reduced, then the light emission will be reduced. Okay. Now we look at the, these uh, sigma minus excitations. So see, magnetic excitation actually creates a spin pointing down. It's orthogonal to the magnetization, right? Then the charge transfer will be suppressed because these two spin is orthogonal. We function is orthogonal to each other. Therefore, the PO will be stronger for sigma minus emissions, right? This is the reason it's just we saw, you know, sigma minus emitted light is stronger than sigma plus. It's due to this spin dependent charge transfer in the system. And uh, the other interesting feature is when this charge transfer happens, means there's extra relaxation channels for electron spins in the WSC2. When you have extra spin relaxation channels, the line width of the POP we see should be broader, right? But for the for the single minus excitation, because the interlayer charge transfer is a, is a forbidden or suppressed, the line width will be narrower compared to the sigma plus excitation, which has a charge transfer. So we can look at the, the we can call it the peak line width with the peak intensity, for example, under sigma plus excitation. Okay? So initially, right, the peak width is broad, and the, for the sigma plus excitation intensity is, you know, the peak intensity is weak because charge transfer. So charge transfer happens, the peak width is broad. Now the switch happens, now the intensity actually increases, the line width now becomes uh, smaller. Then again, there's another switch. The intensity becomes weak, but the line width now becomes broad. And again, there's another switch when, when the peak width becomes narrow, but the intensity now becomes broad. 
And so this exactly basically correlates to my, our understanding, right? As charge transfer happens, the peaking intensity should drop, but language will get broader, right? Excuse me. Sorry. Yes. Uh, for the EG orbital, mm -hmm. like why do why does it prefer spin up? Is that because of Coulomb interaction or Coulomb? No, EG is uh, so basically there's a five five electrons layer, right? Yeah. For Coulomb, you know, the, so EG orbital is the spin. So you, you can host the five spins. So they all, they all the ground states with, without these, uh, you know, the crystal field. So the spin is pointing up. There's a spin down band which is much higher due to exchange interactions. So total you can host the ten spins. Right, the spin up is here. The spin down is up there due to exchange interactions. That's how you get a manifestation. If if EG can have a spin down, then there's no manifestation because exchange field effect. What is the uh, uh, the additional feature around uh, let's say one point eight tesla, one point nine tesla? You mean this little? Oh, the additional feature. One this here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you a little later. Yeah, we'll talk about this. Yeah. Okay. So again, right? I think this is kind of a very interesting effect because we can use uh, it, it's analogous to this GMR. Right? GMR is depends on the spin. You know, magnetization alignment between top and the bottom contents. But what I here have here is actually I can use my light to control the spin you see, in these semiconductors. Then I can control the charge transfers between these two. So it's like a optical type of a switch, right? Okay. So let me just summarize, right? Exchange effect give us these various Z-man splittings. And the spin dependent charge transfer actually gives us effects on the on the language difference and on the on these uh, um, polarization of the systems, luminescence polarizations. And each flip corresponding to the magnetization flip here. But the, the, the first question that time we pass is why we have so many you know different flips, right? So then we do these uh, uh, imaging of the systems by looking at the polarization. Basically, we look at the map of these polarizations, and what we found is. Starting with high field, right? We keep decreasing the field. You will see actually there's a lot of domains happening. Yes, right. You know, this color, different color means different domains. And uh, I can also decrease field from high to low, and you can see these domains again, right? So if I focus on one particular spot, for example, on this spot, you will see once we change the field, the color actually switch twice. So these are the ones that gives these multiple switchings. But if I look at the, the ones at the, this spot, the color only switch once, right? So it means I only should see one switch in terms of if I measure polarization of Z-man splittings. So that's exactly what we did. So for example, I can focus my laser spot at this particular spot. Then I look at the, my polarization as function magnetic field. Then we see multiple switch, right? Because this domain actually will flip twice. However, if I look at uh, you know, this spot again, well, it's close to these domain boundaries, so there's some kind of fuzzy, you know, funny thing that's going on. I'm going to go back and talk about it later, because it's very difficult to understand here. Then, then, then we can look at really at the domain boundaries. You will see, actually, it's complicated, right? But now you already see since the polarization only change, the sign of this polarization only change once, not twice, like I showed you above. And then at the here, Looks like ferromagnetic. We only see the sense switch once. Okay, so we call these two domains. One is uh, weak domain, means you can flip twice. There's a strong domain, can flip once. So this weak strong domain is coming from these uh, basically domain dipole dipole interactions plus e energies. Okay, and there's a, there's a complicated kind of interaction between all these phenomena. But it's, it's difficult to understand. But I will, I will show you a simple example a little later. Even with the even one single domain, it also shows that an homogeneity feature. Yeah, that's right. This homogeneity feature is uh, attributed to the non-uniform ferromagnetic of their S3 layer or to the homogeneity electric of the WS2 layer. Yeah, so this inhomogeneity is due to the interface. The interface. Yeah, because uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you, you will see this much clearer. Yeah. So, so this is the we did uh, three and a half years ago. and. Uh, God is really interested. So the, the information I have here is for this sample we use, the chromium trial is about the 10 nanometer. So that means that there's about the 15 layers. Make the study is a little more complicated to understand these things. So I'm going to show you another example a little later. Yeah. 
Okay. Let me see how much time I have. Two, uh, it's two. about 20 minutes. Okay, so let's see how far we can go. Uh, so now we have this strong weak domain. So the idea we have is can we use light to control these domains, right? If I can use light to control the domain, I can control this proximity effect. Then, then you can think about basically I just, just need to shine light. Then somehow you can think of the effective magnetic field is tuning by just light itself. So we don't need a magnet. We don't need a superconducting magnet, for example, to do measurements, right? But a lot of measurements, you know. You, you don't have access, actually, to the magnetic field. So that's the idea. I'll quickly go through this. Okay, so we, we, for this particular example, I identified two domains, A and B. And for these two domains, let me quickly go through this. You know, for domain B, is, uh, the, the sign only flip once. We know it's a strong domain. But for the domain A, it's a weak domain, means we see multiple sign switchings. Okay, so we focus on this uh, domain A here, all right? Then the next thing what we did is, we look at the hyphoresis curve here, right? As function of excitation power. So starting with low power, right? There's a stronger hyphoresis. Now as I increase the power, you can see this loop actually melted, right? First hint, right? Once we can use the the, the excitation power to control these uh, uh, hysteresis, control basically the spin flip from one to the other states. Then, if we focus on this line, basically you're seeing if I starting with these uh, you know states at the, the top of the loop at the high field, and actually it's going to go down to the bottom of the loop, means the magnetization actually flips sign. So. The way to, to look at these is, let's go back. So I can look at the, this I can plot these uh, uh, polarization as function of magnetic field and the excitation power. You see this 2D map here, right? You see the critical field for spin flow transition is kind of tuned. At least map looks a little familiar with my gate dependent map, right? It's sort of tuning this critical field, but in that case, I use the electric field, you know, or, or doping. This one, what I'm doing here is actually just use laser power, right? And then we can also say we fix on this particular spot, we fix magnetic field here. Then what I did is we can look at the the circular polarized light emission from the samples. And the full micro, you will see, you know, this red color is stronger than blue, means the system is a sigma plus polarized. Then let's increase the excitation power, basically and then go along this line. So you will see, just by simply tuning the laser power, actually I flip the polarization of my light emissions. So means I switch these two light emissions from the values. You know, initially it was a sigma plus dominant, now it becomes sigma minus dominant. All I did is just tuning the laser power. It's equivalent to tuning the magnetic field, actually, in the system. So here, just another map is showing the, the values in splittings, okay? You can think of this as a, a, a map of an exchange field. So let me just quickly, so you know, the bottom one is kind of a more important. This is Z-man splittings, right, as function of the excitation power. You can see that Z-man splitting initially was 4 milli EV, it's positive. Now, as a chain power becomes negative, right, means the sign of this exchange field actually is changed by just simply tuning the excitation base of power. And uh, we can convert this in terms of the uh, effective magnetic field. So you can tune the effective magnetic field basically from minus 16 Tesla to about uh, 7 Teslas. You need to be a light polarized or not? Not polarized. Yeah. And we try to polarize light, see if it can actually tune magnetic field, but it doesn't work. The, the reason is uh, the anisotropy of the system is too strong. So the angular momentum of light is not enough to flip the magnetization. <coughs> okay, so right, the question is, uh, you know, what's happening here, right? Why I shine light can flip these manifestations? So that's two possible effects. The, the simple one always, uh, you know, the, 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 the first one always the simple one, which is a heating effect. You shine light to a sample, just like you stand on a sound. Outside, right? If sunshine, you heat it up, right? It's the same thing. I, we shine a lot of light to a sample, we heat it up. So if you heat it up, then the, the, the hysteresis loop will always melt it. 
Just imagine, you know, you heat up the system, above the curie temperature, then there should be no hysteresis, right? No manifestations. So that's a very trivial interpretation. And uh, to test this, right, we, we, we look at the, uh, you know, RMCD, which is, uh, you can think of correlations, as function of excitation power, okay? That does look like uh, similar to each other, okay? Look, what it means is magnetization indeed actually follows this uh, uh, my light polarization measurement, but uh, maybe the heating matters. Now, if I look at the if I look at the temperature dependence, so I physically warm up the system, not by light, but by just warming it up, right? Now, now you will see the hysteresis does the loop does shrink. However, it doesn't look the same as I increase the power, the power of my, my, my excitation light. So what well, the other say is uh, it's not a simple <coughs> it's just a, a heating effect. I think heating actually plays a role, but not the only effect. It's possible there's a strong photodoping effect. Because imagine, right, I excite, when I shine light, excite the carriers in the WSC2, and this carrier will actually will transfer into the chromium trilay. So when the carrier transfer happens, Effectively, we do we dope the system, right? So it's a photo doping effect. So there's two effects coming into play here. One is the heating effect due to the laser excitations. The other is the doping effect due to the charge transfer. So I think the interplay between these two effects that give rise to this phenomenon. All right, I'm gonna switch this. Okay, so there's a lot of questions come up, and uh, let me try to uh, understand, try to you know, explain to you. You guys are asking a lot of details, right? We also puzzle by all these details. Then what we do is, the, the, the puzzle all coming from because we use uh, quite a thick substrate. And uh, then we, we, we make new samples. Now we can use only two layers or three layers of substrate because we know the magnetic states in two layer or three layer really well. Okay, then we can call it the magnetic states into this uh, behavior in you know, WSC2. Then we can understand all these detailed features. So let's first start with this uh, trilayer, right? And the trilayer, again, remind you, in these uh, uh, correlation measurements, we see these, uh, you know, one, two, three, four steps, right? And there's a three spin flip transitions to represent three states. Then we can go look at this polarization again. Right? You know, you are asking what this little step is. Okay, so now we can understand what this little step is. In this trilayer, first of all, right, the bottom is uh, the, polaris, the light polarization, the degree of polarization in function magnetic field. The top panel, just the uh, rotation, represents the magnetic states. Right. So starting from the three, from, from the magnetic station is fully spin polarized up, and that's increased the field. Then the middle one flipped. Right, the polarization flip up. Okay. When this flip happens. There's a little drop in these polarizations. Then, at this transition, the top surface actually flip, right, spin down into into spin up. Then we have we see a sharp change of these polarizations. You know, the sign also changed. This is because my magnetization changed, right, in the top surface. When the magnetization top surface changed, then the which spin is favored to transfer from WSC two to to M to CI three is also flipped, right? Initially, for example, it's a sigma plus. Initially, with sigma minus may be favored. Then later on, would be if I flip this magnetization M here, then will be favored sigma plus transitions. Okay, so light will be sigma plus for us. Then we can keep doing this. Okay, so this just for please. Then initially, and then finally, we, we reach these states when the spin is fully polarized up. So from these simple measurements, we can tell you know we can tell these little fine difference. But the main message is. The charge transfer between chromium triiodide and WSC2 is dominated by the first layer, the top layer. And the middle layer only introduces uh, these little features here. Okay? But the interface layer is the most important. It determines the degree of polarization, also determines the sign of the polarizations. Okay, that's the first technical message. Right? So spin dependent charge transfer happening is dominated by the first layer. Now, what a surprise result is, now I look at the, the Z-mass splittings, right? So top, again, is the co-rotation, the bottom is, uh, the middle one is the polarization as function magnetic field, and the bottom is the Z-mass splitting as function magnetic field. Now you see something funny, right? 
Actually, the Zeeman spooling is uh, larger in its antiferromagnetic state rather than in its fully magnetic state. Right? This is kind of surprising. Like you would imagine, you know, you know, fully, at least for me, intuitively, I would think, it's fully spin porized, then the Zeeman spooling should be larger. Because in the middle, right, this layer already, you know, pointing to different directions from the first layer. So this was the kind of the surprising results for, for us. And uh, this is a trilayer. Then we go back to do the bilayers. So this is now a sample we measure for the bilayer. Right? The, the left is the correlations, which is typical for a bilayer. And then in the middle is the polarizations. As from in bilayer, again, where you see a little you know, drop here, just due to the bottom layer flip, and then the sharp change, the top layer flipped. Right? But now you look at Zeeman splittings again, right? In the anti ferromagnetic states, actually, Zeeman splitting is larger than when the bilayer in the fully spin polarized state. So we can model this distance, right, by con considering the, the charge hopping from the conduction band WIC2 to the valence band of the chromium triadides. First, we consider the chromium triadide is in anti ferromagnetic states. What it means is the spin hopping from, you know, from one chromium triadide to the other chromium triadide is forbidden. So let's set the hopping term to be zero. But uh, the hopping between is the uh, WIC2 and the chromium triadide first layer is uh, represented by TC here, right? So just by solving this Hamiltonian, then we can find out the conduction band energy shift for this WIC2 is proportional to this term, which is T squared divided by delta. Delta is a band offset. So the different, right? So, so the key is for valley polarization, right? It's due to the spin dependent charge transfer. So this spin dependent charge transfer is actually real electron spin hopping. That's a that's really population transfer. But for the Zeeman splitting, it's an exchange effect. The exchange field effect is a second order actually virtual electron hopping. So, you know, basically electron go to the. You can think of Two, pro two second two, uh, second order process, right? The electron from WIC two will go to the CI three, then will come back to WIC two. Okay, so this will give us the exchange. That's a second order process. So what I'm basically what I'm modeling here is a second order process. You can see the energy shift due to the second order process is proportional to T squared divided by delta C. Then now we can also consider in the fully polarized state. Now we can turn on the charge hopping between these two CI3, not represented by this D here. And we can solve this Hamiltonian again. And uh, we can infer this band shift is proportional to this term. So the difference from previously, right? Basically, we, we involve this D here now in the denominator. OK, so in, in these optical transitions, what I really measure is energy difference between this conduction band and valence band. I'm not, I'm not just measuring the conduction by itself, right? So there's another certain process happening, the charge transfer happening in the valence band. So we can also take into that account to do the similar analysis. We can get another number, which is uh, the, optical, the, the transitions from this uh, uh, valence band. Then, then we can calculate the total energy difference between these ferromagnetic and the anti ferromagnetic states, right? By taking the conduction and the valence band difference. So we got numbers. So so if we plug in the reasonable numbers in the models, actually we can really infer the Zeeman effect, the Zeeman splitting for these anti ferromagnetic states is indeed larger than the fully spin polar states. Okay. All right. So now I, I told you basically we have this strong proximity effect between WIC2 and the CI3s, and we can use these. Uh, uh, we can use the polarization of the light to tell what is the first layer of this magnetization, right? So simply put, if the polarization we saw, if light polarization we see is C or minus polarized, what that means is the top layer should be spin pointing up, right? Simply, you know. And uh, if the P of polarization is a sigma plus polarized, it means the top layer should be spin pointing down. So the polarization of the light is it indicates, basically it's a measure of the magnetization in the system, right? Again, CO minus means the top layer is being pointing up. The CO plus means the spin of top layer is pointing down. So all I need to do is just look at the, what's the polarization of my light. Then I can measure what is the magnetization of the adjacent chromium triad layer. 
Then we can look at the bilayers, right? In a bilayer, sample we have here, for example, as I show here, the bottom is the co-rotation map, all right? So you can see near the field, you know, the small fields, the co-rotation almost vanished, it means the system is in the anti Feynman state. So if I just cool down a sample without applying any magnetic field, okay, just cool it down. First, I look at the, the co-rotation map. It's at bottom. So you can see the co-rotation map is, uh, you know, the signal almost vanished, right? Because the system is in anti Feynman states. So net the magnetization vanishes, there should be no co-rotation signals. So, so that's what we see. Now if I look at the, the cyclical polarization of the luminescence from WIC2, this is what I got in the top. It's very colorful, right? It's not boring. So you will see this red color, this blue color. As I mentioned to you, red color means it's sigma plus polarized, blue color means sigma minus polarized of light, right? Remember? If the sigma minus means the top layer should be pointing up, the sigma plus means the top layer should be pointing down. So from here, we know, from the color of this uh, light polarization, we know actually the top layer in this red color is pointing up, sorry, it's pointing down, and, uh, and uh, for, for the blue means the top layer is pointing up, right? But from the curl rotation map, we know it's in fully anti Feynman states. So what it means is we actually have domains. We have two domains. Right, one domain is we spin up, spin down. The second domain corresponding to sigma plus is radical with the top layer pointing down and the bottom layer pointing up. So what I'm really mapping out here is a anti anti it's a domain structure, but it's a layered anti ferromagnetic states. So for this red color, it represents these uh, anti ferromagnetic states one, and for the blue color, it represents anti ferromagnetic states two. Okay. So these type, you know, layered anti ferromagnetic states, you cannot tell from these uh, uh, correlation mapping because they only matches the total magnetization. But combined with these uh, spatial mapping from these polarization, we actually can tell there's a spontaneous domain formed in these anti ferromagnetic states. All right, and uh, this domain actually can be reconfigured if I apply magnetic field. For example. So I started with, uh, I initialized system into minus 1.3 Tesla, so basically fully polarized the spin states. Then I go back to zero Tesla, right? Initially, you know, left-hand side is a spontaneous polarization map. But once I initialize system, you will see actually most of the domain is gone. Only one left here, right? And I can do the same, just go to net field, then go back to zero, you will see the domain flip signs, but the, the domain boundary doesn't move for this one. Okay, so it means uh, for some domains, we can reconfigure the domain boundaries, but for this particular domain boundary, the domain wall, it doesn't change. So our hypothesis is uh, actually due to this transfer process, there's always strain used in the systems. Then this strain will ping the domain wall. All right. Uh, I, so the other thing we did is you can look at the, you know, the light polarization from these individual domains, right? Clearly, you know, in the top domain, what I show you here is uh, actually the bottom layer flipped first because you look at it, right, the polarization only dropped a little bit as uh, the spin flip transition happened. But for the bottom domains, you see, the polarization actually dropped dramatically first, right? At the flip spin, first the flip spin flip transition means the top layer actually flipped first. So that's the difference between these two domains. So we can all tell this difference by looking at the, the, the polarizations of the light. And we can also imaging these uh, domain evolutions near these uh, spin flip transitions. So the top just a uh, correlation map, the bottom of this polarization map near the spin flip transition. You will see they don't flip at the same time. There's a lot of inhomogeneity going on in the systems. It's just due to, again, likely due to the strains we, we, we formed due to these, uh, uh, you know. Okay. So I think I will stop here, actually. I'll take uh, questions for the last five minutes. Yeah. Um, in the very beginning of the slides, uh, you show there is a multiple level of uh, resistance. But uh, the anti magnetic configuration of this uh, four layer, you know, is, uh, you know, up, down, down. Yeah, you know, if you're interested, just take a picture of this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
These are the you know, at least system people are studying right now published. Yeah. There's a lot of I mean a lot of people working on different systems. Yeah. But uh, it's a very dynamic field. So I think it's sort of a summary of these. Okay, you can continue your question. Yeah. Oh, my question is uh, um, uh, for this uh, tiny resistance, uh, yeah. you know, uh, up, down, up, up, and uh, down, up, down, down, uh, the resistance seems to be diff uh, different. Yeah. So yeah. Why, why is it like that? Because the symmetry is breaked, right? Well, oh, those, those two, the yeah. two configurations to me. Once you have the electric field point there, right? The oh, symmetry I breaks. See. I see. That's just a simple way to think about symmetry mm -hmm. breaks. But the, mm -hmm. the, if you look in details, right, the first conversion is the spin up, spin down, then spin up, spin up, right? Mm -hmm. So the spin polarization, basically the, the light coming, uh, the, sorry, the, the current coming goes through the first layer, it's spin polarized. Mm -hmm. They immediately hit the, the a filter with opposite polarization. Mm -hmm. But now you look at the second conversion. The, 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 the electron will go to two spin filter first, highly polarized, then hit the, a filter with opposite polarization, right? So these two are very different. I see. Yeah. So it's not from AC measurements. No. Oh, okay. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? You guys all look really tired. <laughs> you, you need a break. Yeah. Let's uh, thank our speaker again.